I have the honor to um, introduce um, uh, Anna Helmond and um, Fernando from the West. And uh, well, um, well, I personally, I um, got to know them in early 2018 and we collaborated in some other projects studying mobile apps. Um, Anna Hellman is an Associate Professor of New Media and Digital Culture at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Anna is a pioneer in the discourse of platformization. In her seminal work, The Platformization of the Web, using Facebook as an example, she discussed the rise of, of the platform as the dominant infrastructural and economic model of the social web and its consequences. Fernando van der Wiest is a PhD candidate at uh, the Utrecht U University. Fernando is also a colleague of mine um, at the University of Siegen. And together with Anna, Fernando wrote extensively on the subjects of infrastructure and platform. Um, in their recent work, um, Facebook's evolution, they examined the, ev the evolution of Facebook's programmability and to cooperate partnerships and illustrated Facebook evolution from a social networking site to platform as infrastructure in a very detailed manner. They argued that the dominance of social media platforms like Facebook that we see now is the result of a decade of incremental evolution rather than revolution. Um, with that further ado, I would like to yield the floor to Anna and Fernando. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, and for this kind introduction. And thank you so much for the SMART team for inviting us to hold this lecture on the current state of platformization. So today we'll discuss platformization and how we've studied it so far, both individually as well as through several collaborations. And in doing so, we offer an empirical focus on how to study platforms and platformization which may hopefully also guide and inspire your own work and own thinking. So first we'll give a brief background on what has now been called platform studies and what we consider to be key characteristics of digital platforms. And then we consider how one might study platforms, including historically. And after that, we'll discuss three different cases to consider the different dimensions of platformization based on studies we've conducted. We go into platformization in the mobile ecosystem, how this relates to the infrastructuralization of platforms, as well as platformization in what we refer to as the audience economy. And we conclude with recommending further empirical work on platformization and its consequences. So let's take a, take a step back because we now talk about social media as platforms. But before this platform concept gained prominence, social media such as Facebook and Twitter were often conceptualized as social network sites, defined in a key article by Boyd and Allison as web services in which users can create a profile and then build a list of connections with other users in the network. So here the emphasis was on the network as a metaphor. But in recent years, we've come to talk about social media as platforms. So then what is a platform? Well, this is still a key question in the field. And in an early article from 2009, media scholars Bokos de Montfort outlined an agenda for what they called platform studies because they saw the platform as an understudied layer of new media objects, and they called for more technical rigor and in-depth investigations into how computing technologies work in order to analyze the connections between the technical specif specificity of the object and how it um, formats and shapes culture. So Bogus and Montfort, they refute the idea that what they say, everything these days is a platform and they turn to the computational definition of the platform. Here they argue a platform is a system that can be reprogrammed and therefore customized by outside developers, thereby adapting to countless needs and niches that the original developers from the platform could not have possibly anticipated or accommodated. 
So for them, the key term in this definition of the platform is programmed. If you can program it, it's a platform. If you cannot, then it's not. So they have a rather strict computational understanding of what a platform is. And around the same time, and these articles also go into dialogue with each other, media scholar Talton Gillespie put forward a rather open account of platforms by emphasizing the different connotations or meanings of the term. So in the computational sense, Gillespie also defines a platform as an infrastructure to build applications on. However, he argues, social media companies also use a broader understanding of the term platform that moves beyond its original or beyond its computational meaning. So he highlights how YouTube serves as a platform for amateurs to showcase their talent or how YouTube acts as a platform for advertisers to build brand awareness. So he highlights this more conceptual use of the platform and how it enables platforms to attract different kind of users. So they address developers with this computational meaning, but also evoke uh, the other meanings of the term to address stake other stakeholders such as advertisers or clients. So these different understandings of what a platform is have emerged from different disciplines that have studied digital platforms for over a decade. So platforms could be considered to have been studied from three perspectives. So from an information systems perspective, they have been studied as extensible code bases of software based systems that provide functionality to connected apps and services. And from an economic perspective, they have been studied as multi-sided markets that mediate interactions between different stakeholder groups. And from a media studies perspective, they've been studied critically as non-neutral intermediaries. So what emerges from the many different definitions of platforms, we argue, are two distinctive characteristics of platforms, which constitute what we refer to as their platformness. So first, platforms are characterized by their programmability. If you can program it, it's a platform. If you can't, then it's not. Their modularity, they can be extended and reconfigured. And their interoperability, they can operate alongside each other and communi communicate with each other. And this, these characteristics enable platforms to, to actually go outside of their own boundaries and to share their data and functionality with other software systems. And second, social media platforms need to cater to and mediate these interactions between different stakeholders, including end users, platform partners, developers, marketeers, and advertising companies. And consequently, these platforms have come to be defined as multi-sided markets. So in our own work, we also look to these other platform studies approaches, especially for information systems and business and management studies, and urge for such an interdisciplinary approach to better understand how platforms operationalize their platform power. So let's go a little bit deeper into the two characteristics of platforms, their programmability and multi-sidedness. So how is the programmability of platforms made possible? How does, for example, Facebook become a programmable infrastructure for others? So technically, this is enabled by so-called application programming interfaces, which we've also heard about earlier. And these APIs enable multiple things. So technically, they enable the exchange of data and functionality between platforms and other web services. They enable this software to talk to each other uh, because they're interoperable, they have the same communication mechanisms. And as a result, they also enable platforms to expand themselves into other website apps and other domains. So APIs could be seen as a technological glue of the, of the web. They're kind of like the back-end technology that interconnects the web and all of its services. Think of um, the connection of uh, Tinder and, and Facebook, for example, made possible through the Facebook login. Also think of Cambridge Analytica, where a personality quiz app was built on top of Facebook data. But also all of these like and share buttons, which are also enabled by APIs. 
So that was the programmability of platforms. And the second characteristic we emphasize is their multi-sidedness. So a lot of social media research is focused on the end user, the consumer, but platforms are actually inhibited or used by different types of users. So in his article on platforms, Talton Gillespie characterizes platforms as digital intermediaries that draw together and ne negotiate between different kinds of stakeholders and users, which each come with their own aims and agendas. So this is actually what in economics is described as the multi-sidedness of platforms, which is a way for understanding how platform intermediaries are positioning themselves towards different stakeholders, such as users, developers, advertisers, businesses, as well as a multiplicity of markets, including advertising, entertainment, retail, telecommunications, and others. So platform intermediaries play an important and active role as matchmakers to bring together various partners across industries. So this was a kind of overview of platforms and their characteristics. And now we move on to how this informs studying platformization. So back in 2010, I observed that social media platforms were increasingly embedding themselves into other websites and services with the increasing presence of like, share, and tweet buttons on websites. Or as the New York Times put it in 2011, Facebook was spreading its tentacles over the web. So with my colleague, Caroline Gerlitz, we further explored this process of how platforms are spreading themselves over the web. So the programmability of Facebook enables webmasters and app developers to implement platform features into their own websites and apps, such as the Facebook like button, but also Facebook comments. So technically, these social plugins are API-based platform extensions, which set up data channels between Facebook and external websites and apps. And as such, these platform extensions operate kind of as tentacles, enabling the platform to put its kind of like fingers outside of its own domain and have a presence on other websites and apps. So webmasters and app developers who are implementing these buttons gain extra functionality, while at the same time helping Facebook to expand beyond its boundaries. And because these buttons also have trackers attached to them, they also extend the platform's data mining capabilities beyond their own platform. So what we then observed is a decentralization of data collection through these platform features and a re-centralization of data processing back to the platform, where it can be made valuable for the platform, its users, as well as advertisers. And in doing so, we argue, Facebook is building a data intensive infrastructure by setting up data channels between the platforms and other web services with the help of webmasters and app developers who are implementing these features. So to get a sense of the scale and scope of this data infrastructure, we decided to map it. So what we did is we retrieved a list of the top thousand most visited websites from a service called Alexa. And then we scanned these most visited websites for the presence of Facebook social plugins using the DMI tracker tracker tool. And then we visualized the connections between these websites and trackers using Gephi. So we can immediately observe that a large portion of the most visited websites are connected to Facebook. So this data intensive infrastructure is widespread and actually kind of invisibly operational in the back end of the web. So many websites and apps are glued to Facebook in the back end through these API connections enabled by social buttons. And this also creates an infrastructural dependency of these websites on Facebook. And in 2013, an error in the code of the social plugins actually made that uh, major websites such as news websites like CNN and the Huffington Post were redirecting to an error page on Facebook. So all these websites that were using Facebook's technologies were no longer accessible because of an error in the, in the code of Facebook's like button. 
So as news reporters wrote, Facebook broke the internet. And this is not something that happened once. This happened last year, a few months ago, when all mobile apps that used Facebook features broke down, including Netflix. So I further explored this process of platforms expanding beyond their own boundaries in my work on platformization, which has also been kindly translated into Portuguese last year. So with platformization, I refer to the rise of the platform as a dominant computational infrastructure and economic model of the social web and discuss the consequences of platforms extending themselves into the web and mobile app ecosystem. And I put forward that platformization rests on the dual logic of social media's expansion into the rest of the web and simultaneously their drive to make external web data platform ready. So as an infrastructural model, social media platforms provide a technological framework for others to build on. And this model is geared towards connecting to other websites and apps and collecting their data. And central to the economic model of social media platforms is to transform this external web and app data into formats that allow it to be integrated into Facebook's databases for further use. So these platforms are using their extensions to carefully send formatted platform ready data back to their platforms. And I call this data platform ready or what others have called datafication to focus on how platforms format or reformat external web and app data to fit the underlying business model of the platform. And deep, these two processes of decentralizing platform features and re-centralizing platform ready data characterize what I call the double logic of platformization. And it's through very specific platform features that platforms can expand into the web and also collect this new data. And importantly, this is enabled by the interplay between the platform as well as webmasters and app developers who are implementing these platform features, as well as web users who are engaging with these features. So the agency of the process of platformization lies in between the platform, third party developers and platform users. So while in 2015, I focused on how this process and the implications play out on the web, this process of course affects other industries as well. So within the context of understanding the role of platforms in the cultural industries, Niborg and Poole understand platformization as the penetration of economic, governmental and infrastructural extensions of digital platforms into the web and app ecosystems, fundamentally affecting the operations of the cultural industries. And on an even higher level, Van Dijk describes platformization as a process akin to industrialization or electrification referring to a multifaceted transformation of globalized societies. So platforms are not only transforming the web, but other industries as well. And this effect is so big that Jose van Dijk actually compares platformization to a process such as industrialization. So today we position platformization as a process that drives the technological expansion and economic growth of platforms beyond their current boundaries. And this process does not only affect the web, the mobile ecosystem or the online ad advertising ecosystem, which we'll discuss today, it affects entire markets, industries and even societal domains as we'll hear more about on Wednesday. And now we switch to Fernando. Right. So then how to study those digital platforms and especially how to study them in such a way that we can actually learn more about the relationship between on the one hand, this process of platformization as it unfolds differently in societies around the world, as well as its consequences. And on the other hand, taking into consideration these key characteristics and dynamics of platforms that we consider so important. So their platformness as we've referred to it. What is that relationship? 
And note that we do not have all the answers there. There are many, many different ways to think about platforms and platformization, as, as Anna already pointed out. But we do want to provide you some possible points of entry that we think are very useful. So we recently published an article together about you know, how to study digital platforms and, and platform evolution as well, where we develop a methodological outlook for doing platform research and historical platform studies in particular by focusing on these distinctive characteristics of social media as platforms. So not just as networks, but as platforms really. Um, and not just as websites. That, that means that we don't just look as, at them as websites or as web pages, uh, which we argue are inherently different objects. And to do that, we first reviewed the literature um, on the identified issues and challenges of social media archiving. And these issues and challenges were you know, re related principally to API access, uh, to platform and app data, the ephemerality of platforms and apps and their content, um, their rapid and somewhat invisible update cycles. Um, the dynamic aspect came up earlier as well. And also their inaccessibility by web ar archiving crawlers, which is also an issue. And these issues affect social media's archivability and thus also our capacity as researchers to write the histories of platforms in the end, whether that is today or in 10 years or, or even later. We then reflected on the approaches that have been developed to archive social media and apps and the types of histories that are preferred or privileged through that process to make an argument about platform historiography. So that means you know, the writing of platform history, the way we do that. And for example, we point out that by archiving platforms via these APIs, which is a, a dominant way to think about it, we will implicitly privilege or afford um, historical perspectives that focus on a user's content and interactions as captured in social media data, as datafied. Um, and, but we contend that there's much more to platforms than just users' content and interactions, particularly when we consider social media as platforms and not just as websites, so as objects, as, as a particular type of digital object. And we've added an entire uh, overview of the literature in an appendix to that article for anyone who's interested to, to delve into that further. Um, but social media as digital platforms and also as, as publicly traded companies, so as businesses, they routinely leave all kinds of material traces uh, behind in their production, in their performance, in their embedding, their reception, uh, their business goals, and, and so forth. And these include, you know, AP, uh, APIs already mentioned, but also SDKs, developer pages, reference documentation related to those APIs and SDKs. The, the change logs, the version histories and app development guides, the best practices, debugging tools and ad targeting fields and parameters. They also include business product pages, ad management and insight tools that they offer, webinars that they, that they provide, partner programs and directories that we'll get to uh, in a bit, uh, certifications and award uh, programs, training courses and learning resources, app guidelines and help centers. Um, as well as blog archives and technical reports, research publications and patent applications, developer conferences and meetings, partner summits, earnings releases, uh, SEC filings in the US, court documents and filings, GitHub repositories, may, many more than you might expect, uh, Twitter posts, public statements, <coughs> technology blogs. Um, so, you know, platforms provide all these very diverse set of materials to different user groups that they accommodate. And they do that on different um, domains sometimes, but at least different public pages, subdomains of their websites. And we noted that many of these materials were not really considered as much as we uh, consider they are, because they are so useful uh, that we would really recommend them to be used more. So while so social media certainly do pose all these challenges to their archiving, we also you know, contend that, that these material tr traces that are also there, in fact, that are in fact available and also provide all these opportunities that we can also explore. So that's what we started doing. And based on our inventory of these materials and of the main issues and challenges, um, we can consider this full materiality of platforms. So if we really think of the platform as a type of digital object, then that materiality is, is constituted by all these materials that we can get about them because they are multi-sided and because they are programmable. That gives us all these materials that we can use. And these are also underutilized, um, you know, both in contemporary studies, but also in historical studies about those platforms. 
Um, so in the remainder of that article, we then discuss all the other types of histories that one could also do using all these materials associated with the other sides of platforms beyond the end user. And that for us, that meant in particular, the developer and the business sides that we have been interested in for a long time. But also depending on you know, the platform of study, um, you can think of partners, uh, creators, so creative uh, producers, media and, and publishers, uh, investors, researchers, and more of these user groups that are uh, accommodated. So we discuss how platform sites, especially beyond the user or consumer side, afford these, these other types of histories uh, due to the materiality of the platforms um, when we look at these other sides of the, of, the, of the platform. And we list these afforded histories in, a, in this second appendix that you can see on the slide right now for anyone who is interested as well. So just as an example, consider what Facebook has to offer. Um, it has separate pages on which it addresses uh, some of its user groups. Um, and in addition to what has just been mentioned, there are also pages for um, the way they speak to government actors, to, um, to politics use cases and advocacy use cases, uh, the way they speak to their creators um, and influencers and these types of figures, uh, the way they speak to small businesses instead of just large businesses, and also the way they draw on their communities uh, and build communities for on their platforms. And currently these are all hosted nicely on subdirectories of facebook.com as you can maybe read in the, in the small type. Uh, but in the past, we really had to look for these pages because they weren't all uh, nested under the main page. We really had to find other, uh, other URLs and we even found websites hosted on WordPress CMSs. So that, that really has undergone a lot of professionalization over the years, as we've noted. And so we analyze the source availability in the archive uh, for these materials that, that we just mentioned, all these different sites and all these different materials that, that are available, but not really used as much. Um, and, and this is a visualization of what is available um, based on that, that inventory of the, of the archive along three dimensions. We looked at the volume, so the number of pages uh, that are in the archive on each of these sites. Um, the depth, so the number of days, months, years, however you want to think of it, that, it's, that is spanned by those materials. So how many years are actually, uh, are actually archived and the breadth of availability. So how many of the archives, web archives, because you might know the internet archive, but there are many more, uh, how many of these archives actually hold copies. And that's important for purposes of triangulation between sources, for instance, which is typical to do as a, as a historian. And so the first two, the volume and the depth of availability really you know, lets us look at platforms at a certain uh, granularity or resolution, which is important for historical studies, but also empirical work more generally. Uh, it's really dependent on, on how specific you can look at these developments uh, on different sides of the platform. And these figures present you know, that overview of what is available. And uh, the larger the circle basically is, the larger the, uh, the volume of, of, of snapshots for that uh, website is. And as you can see there on the top, um, you know, most sources are available for Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, and Reddit, and also Instagram. And these are particularly well archived on their developer and business sites. So there's a lot to, can, to gain on the other sites, but definitely the developer and business sites are very interesting for us. So we'll now move on and consider you know, how we have studied platforms and platformization, uh, both individually and together using these materials, different sort of corpuses based on these materials, um, including a historical case studies, but also uh, a non-historical one. So give back to Anna now. So in this first example, I'll discuss how um, a colleague David Nieborg and I um, examined platformization in the mobile ecosystem. So in this study together with David Nieborg, we looked into Facebook's economic growth and expanding platform boundaries in the mobile ecosystem through an analysis of the Facebook Messenger app. So we were interested in examining Facebook's technological expansion and business growth into the mobile ecosystem through Facebook Messenger. So here we focused on these two characteristics on the programmability and multi-sidedness of Messenger. So first we examined um, Facebook Messenger as a computational platform. How does it expand itself infrastructurally 
um, into the mobile ecosystem by offering this set of APIs and software development kits, SDKs, which facilitate messengers programmability. And to analyze this technical dimension, we retrieved all of the Facebook Messenger uh, developer documentation and product documentation from the Internet Archive and analyzed which SDKs and APIs were introduced, when they were introduced and how they enabled platform expansion. And second, to account for the platform's economic growth, we focused on Facebook as a business platform by examining its business strategy and surveying which institution Messenger partners with. So to examine this business dimension, we used Messenger's product documentation as well as publicly available financial information about Facebook for investors, which actually documents Facebook's long-term strategic business goals, its mobile platform strategy, how it aimed to monetize messaging, as well as discuss the growth and role of mobile advertising, the role of partnerships, and many statements specific to the Messenger app and its rollout. So Facebook Messenger is actually one of the most widely used messaging apps with over 1.3 billion active users worldwide. So when we looked into this evolution of Messenger, it initially existed as a feature within the Facebook website. But it was launched as an app in 2011, and then actually the messaging feature was removed from the website in 2014. So in order to understand Facebook and all of its different websites and apps, we conceptualize Facebook as a data infrastructure that is hosting a variety of what we call platform instances that include websites as well as a family of over 72 apps. And each platform instance, such as Messenger, functions as a technical and economic platform configuration that facilitates connections and interactions between users and multiple partners, such as advertisers or businesses. So during its transformation into a mobile business, Messenger became the first platform instance to be launched after the Facebook app. And this could be seen as a form of platform unbundling, where Facebook turns different products or platform instances, such as Messenger, into their own platform that attracts users, businesses, and advertisers. So a key aspect is that Facebook did not merely unbundle Messenger into its own app, but it also turned this Messenger app into a platform. That is, it opened up Messenger to external developers thereby enabling its external uh, expansion into other apps and services. And at the same time, it opened up to a group of selected commercial partners, taking steps to set up this multi-sided markets. So what we observe here is how an app can evolve into an infrastructural platform for other applications, or what Tiwana conceptualizes as a nested platform, or it's actually a platform within a platform. So what we observe here in terms of platformization shows some similarities with platformization on the web. On the one hand, Messenger offers SDKs and APIs to enable developers to integrate Messenger functionalities into their own websites and apps. So it's kind of like an outward extension of Messenger. But in this case, uh, Facebook was also offering uh, the development of bots, extension, and games within Messenger, facilitating the inward extension of Messenger, turning it into kind of a super app similar to WeChat with all external functionality integrated into it. And ultimately, we see the unbundling of Messenger as an example of Facebook's effort to position itself as a central data intermediary in the mobile ecosystem with the aim to become the default connective layer or mobile infrastructure on top of mobile operating system. And in doing so, they're also supplanting and suppressing more open technologies such as making calls and texting because it's now all folded into the Messenger app. And now we switch to Fernando who's gonna talk more about the infrastructuralization of platforms. Right. 
so meanwhile, while this was happening, this change with, with Facebook Messenger, um, we've also seen this introduction of a, what, what, what has been called an infrastructural turn in research on platforms and platformization that we'd like to, to get to now. And in particular, we're thinking of this article that was published by uh, Jean-Christophe Plantin and, and others that appeared in New Media and Society a couple of years ago, where the authors point out that platform-based services were increasingly acquiring the characteristics of infrastructure. While they at the same time, you know, the both new and existing infrastructures were also rebuilt and organized according to the logic of platforms. So platforms becoming infrastructure and infrastructures becoming platforms. And they, they illustrate this point uh, around Google and Facebook in particular. And other, you know, people in other fields also made similar observations, especially in the field of information systems research uh, from a technical perspective. And we agree with their, their assessments of the situation and also see the potential in combining these two you know, theoretical frameworks, infrastructure studies and platform studies uh, for future research in that, in that area. But at the same time, we're maybe less interested in these traditional characteristics of infrastructure that they point out, which is the shared widely accessible systems and, and services of the type often provided or regulated by governments and in the public interest, uh, which is how they sort of define what infrastructure means. Um, and we think these are certainly important aspects, but we also wonder, you know, what makes a platform infrastructure in the first place or how to think about that, given that they are currently not provided or regulated by governments in the public interest. So which other ways can we also think about infrastructure or these platforms becoming infrastructural? Um, and, and that we also, uh, you know, learn a lot from early infrastructure studies work by uh, uh, Star, Star and others. So in a recent piece in Internet Histories, we examined, uh, Jason already mentioned this, uh, we examined the evolution of Facebook's development platform over the years since its launch in 2006, which is two years after the launch of Facebook social network, only two years. Um, and in the analysis, we consider that the evolutionary process um, is really a co-evolution uh, of you know, the platform architecture on the one hand, so the technical architecture on the one hand, and its governance through partnerships in particular, uh, and the control mechanisms that it has, and also its environment that it is part of. And that's really the key aspect uh, that, that we looked into here. So how the platform's architecture on the one end and its environment on the other hand co-evolve. Uh, and that's also sometimes referred to as a platform's ecosystem, that environment that I'm referring to. But it's also really its, its broader competitive market environment. So really the business environment of the platform. And in that study, we trace how Facebook's platform evolved from a social, social network into this platform as infrastructure and also an advertising business at the same time. So to study Facebook's evolving programmability and its evolving boundaries, uh, we developed this methodological approach where we use these archived platform materials that I mentioned earlier uh, to reconstruct that history. And we use the Internet Archive for that purpose. We're specifically interested in how the Facebook platform evolved um, on the one end, vis-a-vis -vis its strategic business partnerships that it formed with business developers uh, and also with digital marketing and advertising agencies over the years. These materials have not really been used in research before, uh, but they allow us to reconstruct Facebook's embed embedding, embeddedness um, within this larger technological, economic and organizational structure, this market environment, and how that evolved over the years, that relationship. So on the slide, you can see screenshots of Facebook's for business um, and, and also information that, that it hosts about its marketing partners program, which is one of its core partner programs uh, from early on, but still today uh, is one of the key ones. And these partners, they claim to help advertisers and businesses on Facebook with a, a variety of advertising and marketing needs uh, for which you can then search and, and contact these partners. Uh, so some of them link, for instance, offline transactions to online Facebook data, which can be very valuable for advertisers and, and also for other, other types of businesses. At the same time, these partners themselves gain access to the marketing API, which is Facebook's business facing API, um, which is most commonly used for programmatic, uh, so automated uh, digital advertising and marketing applications and services. So that's, that's next to the graph API that they also have, which is probably more familiar to people here. However, not everyone can just become a partner. You'll need to apply and get certified first. And that certified means being, according to Facebook, a market leading company in a specific area of expertise, which you define yourself. Uh, and then Facebook basically 
um, assesses whether that is indeed the case and whether it wants to have you as a partner. So it's really selective in that way. And as a result, many of its partners are actually these very large um, market leading firms who develop their own advertising or marketing software, um, have you know, huge, they're, they're huge in terms of what they, um, their revenues, um, and they integrate their services with Facebook's platform. And we can find out about who those players are, uh, what their names are, and what sort of what, what they do really, what they build um, through these partner directories that are available on their websites. So on the one end, we visualize the API platform versions that occurred since 2006, which is the architecture side story, uh, which foregrounds the technological dimension of the platform's evolution. And there are many things to say about this technical, technological evolution, and we're also looking into that still. Uh, but one thing that's really striking is this professionalization that occurs on all of Facebook's platform instances. So there's the graph API, which is, which is one of the, bar, the colored bars that you can see here, uh, the messenger platform, that Anna just mentioned the Instagram platform as well, and the marketing API and, and some other well uh, lesser known uh, platforms that it also has. Uh, and these are integrated in the backend under the current graph API. So they're all integrated into this one structure uh, that, and they also now follow the same versioning logic and the same release schedule. So you can see a cadence really of updates uh, starting to happen. Professionalization is really the key there. So we also traced next to that story, there's the, there's the story about Facebook's partner programs over the years for developers, for marketers and advertisers and others. And you can see that the first ones, the first programs were aimed at development for advertising and marketing development purposes. And that many programs were introduced uh, after 2014, really a big boom of new programs being introduced there. And these programs have been tuned and streamlined uh, and newly launched products, um, so instant articles, for instance, received their own specific boundary, uh, their own resources relevant to that product. So their own partner programs, but also their own APIs, their own SDKs, their own documentation related to those. Um, and there's also a responsive aspect in that because after Cambridge Analytica happened in early 2018, I. Uh, I guess. Uh, there's also a data abuse bounty program. Uh, and with the 2016 uh, elections in the US, we also saw new fact-checking programs, uh, for instance. So for each of these partner programs, you can look at the specialities that, they, um, that they're actually looking for. And they come typically with badges and certifications that you can, that they are often images or things that you can put on your websites. And that's actually really interesting because you know, it's, it, these things remain commonly used to signal expertise and compatibility with Facebook's platform to potential clients. Because of course, if these things are integrated in the backend, uh, how then does some other client that wants to work, wants to advertise on Facebook, how does, they, how do, how does that person know uh, that this other business is working with Facebook uh, and, and using its platform? So there are these images to show that to the outside world. And when we take all of the firms that, we, that were included in Facebook's marketing partner programs over the years, we get this list of partners at 14 different points in time. And we found over a thousand unique partners in that, in that period. We visualize these to show the introduction of new partnerships, the removal of partnerships from the directories and also the many partnership continuities because that's really the bulk of these partnerships. They are often there are many long-term partnerships with marketing and advertising mm -hmm. firms and also data platforms in there. So in many cases, these partnerships have accelerated Facebook growth, but also the other way around. So the partners growth. And so both platforms come to depend on each other, which makes their platforms infrastructural to each other and also, also Facebook's platform infrastructural to this, to this vast network of advertisers and marketeers who work with any of these partners. So they become this collective platform constellation, if you will. Um, and as a constellation, they, they grow. So it's not just about Facebook's growth alone. And we've also looked at Facebook's embedding in the market through these partnerships, which evolves you know, somewhat over time. For instance, you'll see exactly when Facebook starts to form partnerships around external data providers, uh, FBX, which, which used to be this Facebook exchange that's now no longer uh, existing, uh, it, when it started to get into mobile, when it started to offer chat and messaging, 
um, services with with uh, messaging uh, that Anna just mentioned, and other things. So this really lets us examine how how a platform's embedding in a particular marketplace, um, how that looks like and how that evolves. So the different really positions, uh, its position in relation to these different markets. And more generally, we think it's really relevant to consider that growth is indeed not just about user growth, which it's most commonly the story that you know, the number of users has increased for, for a given platform, but also that this expansion of the technological platform and the partner community that, that is connected to that technological platform, that they also co-evolve with that user base. And that's because it is ultimately a multi-sided market. So if, if one side of the platform grows, that has a meaning for the other side of the platform that benefits from that growth as well, which is most commonly called a network effect. So as such, it's really about a platform's operational skill and scope and, and how we should think about these through partnerships as well and how these are accomplished with the help of these partners. And methodologically, also that there are many opportunities for these detailed empirical histories uh, as well as evolutionary perspectives on platforms despite the challenges that are there uh, with regard to the archiving of, of platform uh, materials. So back to Anna for the next part. So finally, we discuss how industry-based platforms through forming partnerships integrate social media with what we refer to as the audience economy. So the entire collection of data intermediaries on the business side of platforms. So these audience intermediaries shape the creation, buying, modeling, and measurement and targeting of data audiences within the ecosystem of platforms. So others have used also the term attention economy, but in our case, it's really about the audience as a core unit of analysis. So this case, once again, foregrounds the importance of considering both the technological and organizational dimensions of platformization. <clears throat> so here you can see the astounding growth of Facebook's advertising revenue over the past decade. But despite the significance also of the digital advertising market, which has over $330 billion in revenue each year, we know very little about the actual structure of this market, how it relates to social media, and the importance of partnerships. So in this case, we focus on the organizational arrangements and software integrations between partners and social media platforms as they enable the formation of a highly integrated and interconnected advertising ecosystem. And in this study, we argue that partners and partnerships play a key role in platformization, the process driving the technological expansion and economic growth of digital platforms beyond their current boundaries, markets, industries, and societal domains. So we explore how partners and the platform infrastructure they build collectively mediate and shape platform power. So we developed the argument that platformization is both, on, both based on an organizational level through partnership arrangements and those that are underpinned by technological arrangements. So application programming interface, uh, API based software integrations between these uh, social media platforms and their partners. So we devise an empirical method to trace partnerships and to map these partnership relationships around the most used social media platforms to examine which partnerships exist, which are exclusive or shared, and to identify key sources or nodes of power. And we examine how industry-based firms through forming partnerships integrate social media with the audience economy. So first we created a list of the leading social media according to Statista. And for the top 20 social media platforms, we actually located 36 different partner directories listing over 1500 unique partnerships in total. So we then collected the names and details for all of these partners using custom built scrapers. So we then visualized the relationships between the top 10 
top 20 social media platforms and their partners, where each node here represents um, a single platform, a single social media company, or a partner company. And each link then is a partnership, thereby highlighting unique and shared partnerships, central players, etc. And we found that the most highly connected partners in the center are all largely cloud platforms that are providing cross-channel marketing solutions, social media management, and audience data sources that traverse multiple social media platforms. And these central nodes in this network include companies such as Oracle, Adobe, SAP, Salesforce, Spreadfest, Axiom, and Experian. So Axiom and Experian are known data brokers. They provide and sell data sets about users. And they're key players in this ecosystem of partnerships around social media. So this is an organizational ecosystem of companies providing platform related tools, products and services. But at the same time, this network is also underpinned by a technical ecosystem of partner integrations. So they could all be read as lines of um, interconnected data flows. So what we see here is who is cooperating with whom, but it also provides a roadmap of all the interconnected and integrated software of these companies enabled by API based software integrations. And these software integrations enable actors within this network to combine data sets about users for targeting purposes, for example. So in short, these partnership networks materialize in organizational arrangements of firms with technological infrastructure between them. In the next step, we focused on those partners in our network who are categorized as these data intermediaries. So we located 67 in the audience intermediaries and we found and scraped another 50 partner directories listing almost 10,000 additional partnerships and software integrations. And then once again, extracted all their names and details and visualized their connections. So as these actors center around audience data, we find that actors that are specialized uh, as data vendors, data marketplaces, ad publishers, ad exchanges, demand side platforms, supply side networks, and of course, internet platforms where one can put those ads. So in forming strategic alliances and by developing these uh, infrastructural integrations, platforms and our partners are collectively building media and data infrastructures. They're building integrations to connect separate data sources, ranging from data on geolocation to offline purposes, to voting behavior, to political leaning. But they also built integrations to connect a wide range of media channels. So you can send your ads um, on different multiple social media platforms, search engines, mobile TV, or even outdoor media. And in building these infrastructures through these technical integrations, social media platforms and data intermediaries are both deeply entrenching themselves within the digital advertising and marketing ecosystem. And because this network is comprised of key actors in digital marketing and advertising, they're also entrenching themselves inside third party websites and apps through various tracking technologies. So when we matched our entire data set to a Ghostry's tracker library, we found that nearly 600 of the actors in our network are also known to operate trackers. So just imagine these 600 tracking companies are tracking users and their behaviors across millions and millions of websites and apps. So these organizational partnerships and technical integrations between different actors and software systems in the audience data and tracker ecosystems then facilitate this finding, creating, expanding and targeting audiences on social media and beyond. So partners, um, social media platforms and their partners are collectively building this highly complex infrastructure facilitating audience creation and targeting that are central practices in the digital advertising and marketing ecosystem. 
And we argue that if we want to better understand the source of social media's platform power, we also have to consider their organizational and technical relationships with data intermediaries in the audience economy. Consequently, platform power does not consolidate within a single platform, but is distributed throughout the ecosystem as these partners help build platform infrastructure. So moving into some conclusions, today we've highlighted two key characteristics of social media as platforms, their programmability and their multi-sidedness. And these two characteristics inform our emphasis on two important distinct mechanisms that drive platformization on the web and beyond, increasingly also across markets, industries, and sectors of societies. So first, the technological dimension focuses on the programmability of platforms and how they use technical sources such as APIs and SDKs to extend their platform boundaries by integrating their data and software in different industries and domains. And second, the organizational dimension, which focuses on the multi-sidedness of platforms and how they attract and engage different stakeholders, such as official partners, to expand their services across different countries, industries, and domains. So we argue for studying platforms and platformizations on these different platform sites. And as we've seen, platformization on the developer sites take a different shape than platformization on the business side. And as we've pointed out, there are many types of empirical materials that are waiting to be used for writing contemporary historical and evolutionary platform studies. And we suggest that it's important to consider the shape of platformization in different environments. First, in the like economy, we initially observed the technical expansion of platform features on the web into external websites with the help of webmasters. And this enabled data tracking across the web with economic consequences and consequences for a user's privacy. And in the mobile ecosystem, we examined how new platforms can evolve or emerge out of current ones and how an app like Messenger can evolve into a platform of its own with its own programmable code base and own platform sites, thereby enabling its growth on its own. And regarding Facebook's evolution, we found this interplay between processes of platformization and infrastructuralization by looking at the co-evolution of the platform's technical architecture, as well as partnerships and the environmental dynamics around the platform. So Facebook and its partners build and constitute this collective platform infrastructure. It's not only built by Facebook itself. And this platform infrastructure is both technological and organizational. So finally, in the audience economy, we take that argument a step further. We examine the strategic of importance of business partnerships within social media. And we were interested in how these partners mediate and shape platform power through infrastructure development, which once again is both technological as API based software extensions and organizational constituted in partnerships. And these cases show how both technological and organizational mechanisms are driving platformization. And through these detailed empirical perspectives, we argue that it's possible to situate platforms in various technological and market environments, which ultimately opens up the way for decentering the usual platform suspects, such as Facebook, Twitter, and Google. Because there are many other platforms that also deserve to be studied. Look at all these platforms we just saw in these network graphs. Because we currently don't know much about industry-based platforms such as Salesforce, Adobe, Oracle, and LifeRamp, and many others like them, which are tightly connected to social media. And this critical orientation further allows us to situate and contextualize platforms and the sources and limits of their power, and not to fetishize the power held by platforms. Thank you. We'll be looking forward to your questions. 
Thank you very much, um, Anna and Fernando, for the super insightful um, keynotes that um, that we that we had just now. Thank you very much. Uh, we can see how platforms are so multifaceted, and of course, there's a very big room for research opportunities. Indeed, it is well the well the platforms are stretching into many areas well, far wider than most people could imagine indeed so we ha so we have about um 20 minutes um for questions so if you have a question please put them um yeah please put it in the chat and i will direct it to um anna and fernando so any questions Okay. I'll, I'll, uh, oh, 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 okay. Um, okay. There's a question from Jana. Um, the technical dimension of platforms is, of course, crucial in your work, not only as content but also as methods and source. In this sense, in the context of digital methods practice, can you talk about the role of technical dimension to the study of platformization? What challenges media researchers should embrace or ignore to study um, platformization empirically? Thank you. Maybe I'll start on maybe, I don't know if Fernanda has an addition to what I'm gonna say. So thank you for this great question. So it's also in the context of uh, digital methods practice. I think it also brings attention to, um, so on the one hand, we can consider digital methods as studying the medium and studying you know, societal issues through the data produced in that medium. And I think this is very much also on studying the medium side of doing digital methods work, which is also highly inspired by software studies approaches. And of course here also infrastructure studies approaches. So what we've highlighted here is um, that um, also, in order to understand changes in our digital methods approaches, as was also highlighted earlier by Elena, uh, and also in the question of what happens, you know, when an API is discontinued or no longer produces particular sets of, uh, of data. Um, by studying this kind of technical side of, um, of, uh, of the platform by looking at the developer documentation. So what we argue here is that we can actually inform our digital methods work by better understanding how, for example, an API evolves over time. So um, in the section that uh, Fernando also presented, we outlined also the relevance of these uh, materials of uh, Facebook as a development platform for a better understanding how you know, uh, it works as a technical platform, not only for users and businesses, but also for researchers. So in our current research, we're actually looking much, much closer into that. But what is core here is that the API is, a, is just an unstable uh, object as the platform itself is for users. And if we want to uh, be able to understand or um, empirically analyze how you know how the API for researchers changes over time that we have this wealth of information available in you know web archives such as the Internet Archive that can also better help us understand how our digital methods informed work that relies on these APIs also evolves over time or what the consequences are of these APIs evolving over time, which decisions have been made by the platform, which data is available on day one, which data is no longer available. Did it always format the data in a particular way? So this is very important for doing kind of like source criticism of our data in doing digital methods work. So that would be uh, one part of the answer to that. <laughs> Yeah, well, as a developer myself, I cannot agree more with the um, problem that the APIs change a lot and they are, well, are always uh, are all a, a major source of pain for developers to cope with the ever changing environment. And thank you, Anna, for the response. And do you have any other questions? Can I just or add to that for a second still? 
Uh, sure, Fernando, but yes, please okay. go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to underline what Anna just, just said in the first place, uh, but also mention that in the past, of course, and Anna presented the example of the like economy. And at, at that point, you know, the, the development of the tracker tracker tool was part of that research because at the time, you know, the, the main focus was on the technological layer um, by itself. And that is a medium layer in the end. Uh, whereas in the sort of more recent re research that we've presented, uh, it's not just about that, that technological side anymore. So it's also you know, not enough maybe in a way to just follow the medium and its methods uh, in that sense. But also that the, um, you know, when we follow the medium, in this case, what we've tried to argue is also that the medium looks differently depending on you know, which side you are on, which, which, what type of user you are. For a business user, the medium looks very differently than for an end user. Um, and so that gives all these opportunities, for instance, you know, when we look at the ad interfaces, the targeting interfaces and all the options in there, uh, people have started to explore these things because that is also the medium and there's a lot of, you know, methods that we can develop based on that, that other side of the medium as well. So I think there's also a lot to still explore and gain um, on that side uh, of the medium. Thank you, Fernando. Um, are there any more questions? Um, if there isn't one here, I would like to take, uh, well, I use my privilege to, you use my privilege to ask a, a question. Um, well, you mentioned that um, there are um, well, quite many things about platforms that are not well studied yet, and there are quite um, many research opportunities. And one of the things that the tax base um, 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 is concerned about is the hoarding of patents. There are, there are so many platforms and companies that are um, well, well developing nonsense patents or, 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 or registering patents that that they don't use now but they may eventually uh, monetize on those patents and yeah of course this is one of also a major factor um, in the economy um, of the platforms and this is this is just uh, one of those uh, many things that are not uh, well studied and uh, to your um, well to your opinion, Let's say if you want to come up uh, with a, a, a list of priority in terms of the economy of the platforms, would, uh, well, what factors might get to the top of the uh, agenda? I'll try to give an answer to that. That's that's a very interesting um, development indeed. I, I think that is, you know, also something that hasn't been really considered as much. Um, I think it came up a couple of times, but not really, you know, structurally as a concern for media scholars at least. Um, you know, I think it's it's a very interesting development because the more powerful, the bigger the platforms become. You know, the more power they have to do these things. Uh, the more sort of in, the more people they can hire to 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 get that. Uh, to, to register those patents in the end. Um, so maybe we can see that as, you know, not being a good development at the same time, you know, these documents are still public because pa patent applications are registered. So I guess it's still better than not having anything at all about, you know, that we can look at uh, if we wouldn't have anything to look at about how those methods techniques work, then, you know, we would have even less. So I guess we should be happy that there are still these patent filings. Um, but definitely, again, that they you know aren't really used as much. But there is a wealth of information in those applications uh, that we could use, including related to the to the ad, uh, the targeting sort of techniques I mentioned before. Uh, I remember at some point uh, this this article came out about um, the, the the way in which they do the uh, in which in which Facebook Facebook did the categorization of people by socioeconomic class. And there was a, a patent registration done for that. And then suddenly, you know, there's, there's journalistic interest in that. Uh, but of course we can also use that information to detail how the medium works. So I guess there's always a two, side, a two sides to the, to the story. It also offers opportunities. Yeah, thank you, Fernando. Now we have a question from Charis. Uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it, your name. Um, thank you so much for an insightful presentation in terms of governance. What would platformization and platforms omnipresent expansion mean for the creation of 
cultural artifacts and culture creators' dependency on platforms like news and media? What effect does it have in terms of power dynamics and asymmetries? Thank you. So thanks for this great question, which also points towards to how platformization also affects other industries. And um, here I would also yeah, like to recommend some literature on uh, from, from our colleagues. So for example, um, um, uh, Nibor Hampoul have written about you know, platformization of the cultural industries where they, they discuss how these cultural artifacts are, where the production of these cultural artifacts is affected. Um, and in the, the book on the platform society, by uh, Jose van Dijk and co-authors, they discuss the effects uh, on news. And what I find also um, really interesting also when we discuss it here in terms of, um, um, you know, a centralization, decentralization, and also gaining these infrastructural uh, properties, we do see these highly, highly um, um, asymm asymmetry um, um, emerging. So while on the one hand, these, these platform partners are, for example, very reliant on these platforms, and these platforms are very reliant on these partners, because they're basically outsourcing uh, all kinds of uh, advertising services to these partners. So they're sent their clients to these partners, like this company can help you with all your Facebook advertising uh, uh, needs. It also creates like, um, uh, yeah, a mutual dependence on these kind of uh, services, where also these other companies gain uh, power dynamics uh, that go beyond the social media platforms themselves. So what we observed when we mapped, you know, all these audience intermediaries in the in the audience economy, is that there were a few central actors that are actually um, these giant corporations such as uh, Adobe and SAP, um, because they enable they have software. Uh, in which they also operate data markets, for example. So what these giant actors do is they kind of like converge around all these social media platforms, then also connect to all of their partners. And in doing so, they are also establishing themselves as core, um, um, yeah, core actors uh, in the industry, which creates high, uh, high asymmetry in terms of these uh, uh, power dynamics. Uh, and maybe Fernando could add something about advertising in general there. I, I can just add that, um, you know, if advertising has become this dominant uh, funding model, I guess, for, for the creative industries related to the internet and, you know, journalists and, and developers even, you know, a lot of different types of, of content producers, develop, uh, app developers, games developers, and so forth, if they all rely increasingly on advertising as their, as their source of income, um, you know, then what happens when we take that away uh, or when, you know, when that's regulated, which is another question that I just see coming up. Um, I guess, you know, those are open questions. I would love to sort of also see more work on that, but I don't think that's clear at the moment. And it's, it's also difficult to, to see that. What we have seen is that over the time, um, as we have been looking at that entire landscape, many of the players in it have uh, either, you know, just disappeared because they, they failed, uh, but many more, they have been acquired, for instance, a lot of acquisitions in that space and mergers. Uh, so a huge wave of consolidation and actually also several waves. So, so there have been waves, for instance, of uh, integration of data platforms in these advertising players um, to also sort of anticipate the regulation um, by GDPR uh, that it posed and especially related to cookies that are increasingly difficult for them to use because of the uh, sort of the, the changing uh, possibilities around cookies for, due, due to GDPR. Um, so they, they're really looking for other ways to use data, to collect data. Um, and that also has consequences for the type of companies that you see in that space. Um, we have a question from Jose uh, well, about the GDPR. Um, is it possible to empirically analyze the impact of regulation on networks you presented? I'm um, thinking about the GDPR, for instance. Thank you. 
No, that's a great question because um, uh, we would say partially, yes, you could actually see it from uh, the changing composition of the networks because what we've observed is, um, so we've been mapping these partnerships for maybe almost five years now. So we also see how the, you know, how the network changes over time. And what we do see is, especially when we look at the specialties of partners, that they are specifically also positioning themselves in terms of uh, finding solutions for, you know, um, for um, G GDPR um, approved ways to use data. So they're really, we see these platforms actually um, rhetorically positioning themselves as, you know, offering solution for the current GDPR um, uh, implementations. And the second thing that we also found is um, when we looked in more closely into how these APIs evolve over time, we actually saw, for example, that at one point, particular elements or fields of the API were no longer accessible because uh, they had to be um, uh, deprecated for, uh, for, for the context of Europe in, you know, to follow uh, current GDPR regulations. So to put it simply, what we find is you have all kinds of data available for APIs, but in a documentation, we actually find which are the key elements that are no longer available for users in Europe or for developers or marketeers in Europe because they have to apply to the GDPR. And here it's interesting, of course, that the documentation um, then also distinguishes between, for example, US-based or North America-based developers and European developers who actually now have different kind of access to data due to the implications of GDPR. So yes, we find how the platform responds uh, and how the ecosystem responds to these new kind of like legal uh, regulatory frameworks, um, both in the composition and in the kind of data they make available to others. Um, thank you, Anna, for the um, um, for the response. So, are there any other questions? Um, okay, we have. Um, uh, if not, well, I have another question as well. Um, so, uh, so, 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 um, so, in your so in your research, would it be um, also a great to um, discuss a bit on um, the um, the cloud platforms. We see that the cloud platforms indeed are gaining a lot of um, power. Where uh, for 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 example, after the um, the uh, the capital siege in the United States, uh, Amazon abandoned um, a a social media app called Parler to use its platform. Well, in the past, when we develop apps, we are free. We are a lot freer to host our service anywhere. So uh, we we are not so um, bound by uh, uh, a particular um. um um, um, infrastructure or cloud service providers, but now the powers, as you said, they are there. There's a trend of um, re-centralization. So the these traditional um, cloud services are, um, are are concentrating into the hands of a few uh, big cloud service providers. Uh, yeah, I would wonder if these big cloud service providers are who uh, provide the, the infrastructures for many other apps um, developers uh, while well, also gaining well tremendous well tremendously great power in terms of politics and there are lots of intricacies with the political development um, yeah would that be a kind of an interesting thing to look at I wonder one thing um, that we did mention in the presentation early on um, is this this platformization tree that Anna has shown, right? This uh, this sort of layered metaphor of of infrastructure on the web um, that Joseph van Dijk is also working on. I, I guess you also talk about that um, later this week, um, because of course there is a lot of sort of vertical structuring happening in this space because mm -hmm. of the platform logic being this dominant model uh, to, to uh, on the web. Um, and indeed, you know, you can separate these layers, you can look at what they are, and if you sort of look at the most 
lowest layers. Um, there are these cloud providing services for data storage, for, for computation and these types of things. And then, you know, throughout that structure, there are all these, you know, specific services, including things like payment today, uh, you know, it's increasingly up there. Um, so I guess we can, you know, start to look at all those layers that, that appear somewhere in between, you know, that, that cloud providing layer at the bottom and sort of the, the usage layer in between, and then sort of all the implications there are uh, for specific domains, um, you know, in, in journalism, in, in the news, um, in the urban sector, and so on. Thank you so much, Fernando. Maybe um, I can add sorry. a final sentence to that. Also, in regard to what you point out, you know, that the enormous role of Amazon on the web as one of these core central infrastructural players. And this is also actually what we uh, kind of hope to inspire is to move beyond, you know, while we've worked quite a bit on social media and, and platformization in the context of social media, by focusing, for example, on these partners, we also hope to emphasize, you know, all these other kind of like more business platforms that are so prominent or so much uh, uh, structuring our daily uh, daily lives. So it's it's not only you know Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram that we should focus on, but as you you know you Jason also point out, we also need to pay attention to things like Amazon, which are like a core infrastructural layer for uh, anyone who wants to you know run an app or 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 process lots of uh, lots of data so this this layeredness that that fernando just referred to platforms exist on the web in many different shapes and on many different layers right at the bottom as these uh, cloud services then somewhere in between as uh, advertising platforms and then in the end we have the user platforms so there are all kinds of different platforms and we also hope that platform studies in general will move beyond only studying social media, but also to consider all of these other platforms that we see online and on the web. Thank you very much, uh, Anna and Fernando. So this concludes our keynote and well, your presentation and response have been super insightful, thank you.